All right, so there's a few people, but the majority, it looks like it's kind of a new thing. All right, um, I was gonna ask how many of you have actually built a map before, but given the relatively small percentage of people who know anything about it, I think I can skip that one. Uh, so this is, uh, most of what I'm gonna be talking about tonight is based obviously on these two um, resources. These two are the two best resources about impact mapping, the impactmapping.org website, um, and then of course the book itself by uh, Goiko Acic. Um, you will see that um, there are a number of graphics throughout the presentation that are taken directly from the book. Uh, Goiko actually was kind enough to um, give me permission to use those, so if you find graphics throughout that are a little bit sort of cartoonish and aren't otherwise attributed, they're all straight from the book. <coughs> so um, the other thing that I wanted to uh, say before we really get started is that we will have an interactive exercise, but considering that this is an intro for many of you and um, I wanna also spend some time on kind of, you know, setting the, the stage for you and giving you an overview of what this is all about and also uh, have some time to share some of the lessons learned that I've uh, come across, some of the pitfalls, all those types of things. So we will be doing you know, that, act uh, that activity, but it'll be sort of more towards the end. Just wanna make sure that everybody has an idea of what to expect. All right, um, so to start off, I just wanna talk a little bit about how I think impact mapping fits into the greater, the bigger picture of Agile. And um, I think it's pretty safe to say that over the last, whatever, 15, 20 years or so, we have entered what you could call an age of complexity. And that complexity is very much reflected in the kind of software that dominates the landscape today, right? We used to build more or less standalone systems um, that automated existing processes in support of other products or services. Today, more often than not, the software is the product. I think it was Luke Holman who just posted on, on LinkedIn today that pretty much everything is software-centric today. Um, almost every product, the, the competitive advantage has a lot to do with software. And so today what we're building is, um, you know, the software is the product. Our environments are changing faster and faster. We're building things in support of new workflows or value streams that are only possible because everything is interconnected. And more and more we're switching from, um, software that facilitates human decision making to actually asking the software to make decisions for us. A lot of predictive analytics, a lot of machine learning, we're moving now into the realm where we're actually handing decision making authority over to the software. And along with that, of course, we're moving from an environment that you could describe as complicated, where with enough upfront analysis and enough upfront planning, you could sort of figure out what the best solution was supposed to be we definitely are moving more and more into an environment that um, you'd have to describe as complex, where the best solution, or really the path to the solution at all, is not necessarily knowable up front. This is what we often refer to in the agile world as emerging solutions. Now the good thing is we have known for a really long time how to deal with complexity, and that is basically by cutting the work we do into smaller chunks, executing on that, and then checking how we're doing. Basically, we're doing small iterative learning loops, right? And this is probably one of the oldest ones. This is Deming's uh, plan, do, check, act mm -hmm. cycle. This goes all the way back to the 1940s. So this concept is not really new at all. And I think the, the military has also had a version of this for a very, very long time. Um, and somebody mentioned uh, Lean, and, and uh, I think you mentioned Lean and the Toyota production system earlier, and they were among the, the first that really picked up on this uh, at an industrial scale and used it to their advantage. But the concepts have been around for a long time. And of course, more and more, we're also using this in software development. Um, that is, to a large degree, what Agile is all about, right? If we look at our classic Scrum model here, how many learning loops are baked into this model? What's, what loops can you see in this? Two. Two? All right. Which ones? There's the daily Scrum, right? That is a loop where every day we check what happened yesterday and do we need to change our plans for today based on what happened, right? And then the bigger one, of course, is the sprint itself. And you could argue that in and of itself is actually two separate learning loops because we're learning both about the product and about the process. So there's, you could argue that the entire Scrum framework consists of three th learning loops. And um, I heard, I don't know, I think it was Craig Larman maybe who said that, um, Scrum is actually on purpose a very empty framework 
we don't define a whole lot of stuff, right? There's, what, three, four meetings and three roles and a few deliverables. But the things that are specified in the Scrum framework, almost all serve to reinforce these learning loops. Think about it, right? The meetings are all inspect and adapt meetings. The deliverables are outputs of those things. And that's it. So almost the entire Scrum model is about iterative feedback loops, which I think when I sort of, when that sort of sank in, it really, re it really emphasized for me the point that feedback loops is what Agile is all about at its core. Now, the problem is, of course, in many organizations, Agile is kind of something that happens mostly in the IT world, right? I mean, there are attempts to move it out of that, but in many cases, it's still a thing for the developers plus the surrounding supporting actors. And then, of course, what happens is very often that we end up with something like this, water scrum fall, right? Where we have a long requirements phase that creates the backlog, which then hardly ever changes anymore because, hey, we've done all this analysis, so we know exactly what we need, right? And then the dev team iterates furiously over that and cranks out working software every couple of weeks, which is great. And then they throw it over the wall to the ops guys, and there it sits and sits. And depending on what your release cycle is and how painful that is, and it's in many places still very, very painful, we might be cranking out working software every two weeks only to deploy it twice a year. So that's maybe a little bit of a problem. Now, on the tail end of this, we have gotten better. DevOps is definitely helping a lot streamline that process of how do we get this wonderful working software out into the wild and into production and all that. So there's lots of progress there. But on the front end, the scope of Agile traditionally starts with the backlog, right? The product backlog. The backlog just is. <coughs> How the product owner is supposed to figure out what goes into that backlog and how, are they how they are supposed to prioritize and all that good stuff. Um, it's not that Agile doesn't care, it's just completely out of scope. There's very, very little guidance on that. And so the, product, the process of creating the product backlog is just sort of this great big cloud of mystery back there or in, in, in the front. So why is that a problem? Well, as Agilists, we care about creating working software. That is our measure of progress, right? We, we create features, we produce output. But what is the value of a specific feature? Well, it kind of depends, right? I mean, we always throw around this number that what 60% of all features are rarely if ever used, and what's the value of those features? Is it zero? Considering that by adding more features, you actually make software more complex, and you create feature bloat, and you create design bloat, and you create usability problems, and you create maintainability problems, and all that stuff. Maybe making more features, actually, that don't really get used very much, maybe the value of those features is not just zero, maybe it's actually negative. Just depends. So maybe what's actually more important is not whether we're creating a lot of features, but what happens what do our users do once they have those features in hand? How does their behavior change? What is the outcome of deploying this particular feature? Do they complete our checkout process more often now that we've uh, you know, sub, um, deployed some new change? Are there less errors in our budget tracking application or whatever? And that's great, but then again, how much does that really matter? If I'm an e-commerce, if I have an e-commerce application, and I sell a lot of really low margin items, um, then maybe people completing that checkout process you know, very quickly is not the greatest thing. Maybe I really wanna instead steer them towards higher margin items, or I want them to at least cram a lot of these pencils into that cart before they check out, especially if I offer free shipping. But on the other hand, if I'm amazon.com, and all I care about is world domination through market share, then getting people to check out as quickly as possible is a really good idea, and that's why I come up with products that I can stick on my refrigerator and order diapers right while I get my beer out. Right? That's, you can tell, it, it, then that's a big win. But it really, really depends. So maybe what it really depends on is what is the impact of this feature and the resulting behavior change on our organizational goals. Maybe that's what it's all about. Um, Goiko Acic Indi, the guy who wrote the impact mapping book, um, at the last conference last year, he told a story about a project, an IT project at the BBC in England, where 
After three years, they had burned 75 million pounds before finally somebody realized that it was very, very unclear what value this project had actually produced to date. 75 million pounds, and they were like, hmm. So what happened? How, how did this happen? Well, it was you know, an agile project. They probably had burn down charts and velocity tracking, and we're probably producing working software every couple of weeks. So for once, we can't blame it all on waterfall. <laughs> but apparently, the product managers had used the iterative nature of this project to continuously redefine what it was all about. So every release, it was like, oh, we're after something else now. Goiko calls this squirrel-driven product management. <laughs> Ooh, look at this wonderful nut I have here. Isn't it all, ooh, look at that one. That's even bigger. Let me go for that one. Maybe this one, I can't decide. You know, so the point here is that if you don't keep a very close eye on the value that your project is supposed to deliver, you can run a perfect agile project and still get yourself into deep, deep trouble. Now, the agile community has thought about this. Um, on the left here, you see the, the traditional iron triangle of project management, which we should maybe really rename to the rubber triangle of project management because things always sort of turn to, to be a lot more flexible when we initially sort of proposed, right? And the idea here is that we start with the requirements. This is everything that this thing needs to do. We fix the scope and then we make estimates of how long it's going to take to get there and how much money that's going to cost. And that always works out well, doesn't it? Right? Yeah, there would be no Agile if that had worked. So the problem is, of course, that we're making estimates at a time that we know very little about what this project is actually about. So, and that's, of course, why the uh, these estimates tend to be somewhere between bad and horrendous. So the Agile answer to that is that, well, maybe we turn this whole thing around. And we start out and say, we're going to set aside a certain amount of money and time. And we're going to start from a goal or a vision that we have. And then we're going to use this money and time to build the most important things that get us closer to that goal. Right? We can't exactly tell you how much we're going to give you for that money. I'm not going to commit to that. But the good thing is we can promise you that we're going to build the most valuable things first. So however far we get, you've gotten the most value out of it. And an interesting thing happens with that. If your sponsor comes back and asks the question that they always ask, how much is it going to cost you to build the stuff that I need? We can now turn around and ask them, well, Mr. Sponsor, how much do you want to invest in reaching this goal? Sweet, right? Because all of a sudden, our IT project moved from being a cost sink to being an investment towards the organization's strategic goals, as it should be. <coughs> if a lot of your competitive advantage these days is based on software, then software is an investment, not just a cost. And by asking, flipping these things around and asking how much do you want to invest, we can take the seat at the table that we should have. Like everything else, how much do you want to invest? And then we'll see how far we get. Could the client not look at this the same way in the old paradigm? Well, the problem is that the old paradigm starts with the assumption that we know exactly what we're going to need. And then based on that, we make estimates. And there's two things wrong with that. One, we don't exactly know what we need. And that's actually what the rest of this evening is about. And the second part is that when we first put this out in sort of theor in a, a theoretical matter, uh, manner, we are really bad at estimating because there's just too much uncertainty. That's that whole thing about complexity that I talked about earlier. The way to that final thing that we want to have, even if we knew perfectly well what it's supposed to be, most of the things we're building today are so complex that you can't exactly tell how long it's going to take and how much money it's going to cost and how many detours you're going to have to do and where you're going to run into dead ends and all that good stuff. And I mean, to me, I often, when I talk to people about Agile who don't really know anything about Agile, one of the things I say is that for me, it really is a tool to manage uncertainty. You, you, rather than trying to pretend that you can plan that uncertainty away and that you are in control of everything because you are Mr. Manager and you are in this position because you know how stuff works, 
we basically with Agile say, well, we know there's uncertainty and there's stuff going to be happening that we don't understand and we can't anticipate, and we're going to plan for that because it's going to happen anyway. And what we do instead is be able, when that hits, we're going to be able to adjust as quickly <coughs> as possible. Because uncertainty is just, it's just the reality of business today. And, and trying to stick your head in the sand and saying, no, 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 I can make that go away. That's, that, that is actually one of the main reasons why projects fail, in my opinion. I mean, right? Uncertainty is a reality of life these days. And yet, it is so incredibly uncomfortable. Uncertainty is not nice. Nobody likes uncertainty. Because, I mean, basically, there was a, uh, a podcast that the um, Freakonomics guys did uh, a couple of years ago. And it was the entire premise of the show was that the three most difficult words in the English language, at least in a corporate setting, are I don't know. And that's true in most cultures, right? In most cultures, getting up in front of a table of, you know, a conference room of your peers and saying, when the, when the executive VP asks, so, how is this going to go? And you stand up and say, I don't know. Yeah, thank you. Um, what are you doing here? Why did somebody make you a manager? You're clearly incompetent, right? And Agile basically says, yeah, it is true. We don't know. We're trying our best to anticipate it, but there will be course corrections. Uh, slightly longer answer to your question than you were probably looking for, but to me that's actually very much, uh, I, you know, I appreciate you asking that because it's, for me that's very much at the core of why Agile is, you know, why we care about Agile and why we think it's more successful. So I don't want to derail your presentation, but I mean, this is a federal industry sitting in D.C. <laughs> Explain to them we're going to hope to invest in your features versus, you know, give me an exact amount that it's going to take for a team of 10 people to deliver this product. And we run into that problem pretty much in every contract. And some federal agencies are getting smarter about writing contracts that allow for that. Others are trying to do it but are stuck in contracts <coughs> that require these sorts of things. The worst ones are where one function is done by one contractor and the QA is somebody else. Mm -hmm. And you can't talk to each other because otherwise it's not independent verification. Yeah, lovely. <laughs> um, so. It, it, is a trans it is a transitional thing. It really is. But the good thing is um, we do a lot of work for USCIS, and they, for example, have an extremely enlightened CIO, and they have umbrella contracts where they basically hire for a digital portfolio, and they just hire complete teams, and then they get to decide team number one works on this, team number two, same thing, team number three, something else, and every six months we can reshuffle as we need. So they are hiring resources and people who can do the work rather than for a specific scope. So it is possible. Um, Ryan, who sits next to you here, um, I know he's been looking into like how do we make agile contracting work, and um, there's some good resources out there. There's there's a, a meetup called Adapt. If any of you are associated with the federal government, um, that's a, that's someone to check out because they think about things like that. All right, raise, raise your hand if you would answer this question with yes. I would raise two hands. Yeah. Yes. Simple answer is yes. Agile is now something to package up and sell. Um, Agile is the new CMMI. Um, I'm not going to name names about the other scaling framework. Um, thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, you know, and the problem is if neither the, the, the provider nor the buyer really understand it, then the outcome is usually not very pretty and there's a lot of backlash against Agile, it doesn't work and all that stuff. And while the excuse, well, you didn't do it right, is a little bit lame over time, there are some actual problems, especially with large scale transformations. But yes, if neither the client nor the person supposedly helping them get there knows really what it's about and understand some of these underlying principles, then yeah, um, that's not helping. I think it is more of a mindset difference. A cost is something that I throw at something and I don't really, it's sort of, it's gone. An investment is, the mindset of an investment is like, well, I kind of determine how much I'm going to put into that and I'm looking for a specific return on that and I understand that in order to get that return, I need to put a certain amount in. So technically speaking, you're absolutely correct, don't get me wrong, but it is, 
I mean, right now people mostly, like, like executives mostly look at IT as a cost sink in many cases, right? It's like this is where money goes to die and then sometimes I get something for it and most of the time I don't. Yeah, I would argue that the difference is that uh, the cost is expected, the uncertainty is <coughs> Yeah, that too, that too. Yeah, the investment is, I mean, if you invest in the stock market, you understand that you can't exactly predict the return. You're hoping and you're, you're investing in the things that, are gonna, that you think are going to work best for you, but it's, I, that's a good point. Thanks, Rich. Also, it's different culturally. Whereas in investment, you're putting a budget box around it to kind of force this prioritization. Whereas the other one's driven, uh, a cost is driven by the future, then <coughs> yeah. it's different culture. Yeah. Yeah, very much, very much. So yeah, there's all kinds of connotations where I think just using a different <coughs> term has a really, a, you know, brings across an entirely different approach of what we're spending this money on. All right, so we have this goal, we have this vision, we have some money, we're gonna build the highest value stuff first, everything is awesome, right? Now, all we have to do is identify those superstar highest value features and we are off to the races, right? And sometimes that is a little bit difficult. And this is where impact mapping comes into play. So, what is an impact map? It's something that is done, at least the first one, the, start, uh, the, the initialization of it, is done before Agile really starts. So it kind of addresses that cloud of mystery that I talked about <coughs> earlier, right? It is done collaboratively by the business and the technical folks. Um, we want sort of seniorish people, not necessarily the ones all the way at the top because they generally don't know enough of the detail of how stuff really works, but we also don't want people who are constantly, who can't get out of the weeds because at least initially it's more of a bit of a strategic um, you know, way of thinking. It is a, we create a visual map and that visual map expresses the shared understanding that gets generated from the collaboration of these different stakeholders. And the map basically expresses not only a scope of what it is that we're setting out to do, but all the possible solutions to that issue that we can come up with, and very importantly, the underlying assumptions that flow into each one of those possible solutions. And we'll get back to these assumptions in a little bit. Right? So what does an impact map look like? Well, this is an example. This is sort of the super generic example. Um, impact mapping is basically a form of structured brainstorming. You see the map looks sort of like a mind map. Um, you could also, uh, uh, structure-wise, it's also a little bit like a fishbone or an Ishikawa diagram, cause and effect diagram, if you're familiar with those. It's just sort of turned in on itself. Um, there is an element of the five whys, right? Except we ask a different question at each level. So it's all very much about helping you structure your problem solving approach. In the center of it all is the why. Why are we even thinking about starting this endeavor? What is the goal that we're trying to achieve? Do we want to have a single goal? Now there are ways of combining you know, two goals into one <laughs> if necessary, but we really want to have a single goal if possible. We then think about who are the people, who are the actors that can help us achieve this goal? Who has an influence on that? For each of these actors, we think about how would they do that? How would they have to change their behavior in order to help us achieve our goal? And only at the very last level do we talk about what is it that we need to do to help these actors change behavior? So and this is actually a very important point. It is a features last approach. So we don't start with the solutioneering like we normally do. Features are the last thing we talk about. And for those of you interested in that, you can tell that there's also an element of behavioral design in there because what we're basically doing is thinking about how can we influence people to change their behavior in a way that is positive for our goal. Right. So overall, the goal of this map is, again, to create this shared understanding that we're always after between different types of stakeholders and to help us form consensus around which actors and behavior changes we should prioritize and where we should start exploring first. That's sort of the overall goal. We'll, we'll talk in a lot more detail, so I'm gonna <coughs> postpone that one, is okay? All right, so here's an example from the book. Um, the map is now flipped around, the Y is on the right side. Um, and this example is basically about an online gaming system or an online game. And the goal is to get to one million players. 
And there's different actors that can help us with that. And you can tell that the branch for the players is actually fleshed out a lot more than the rest of it, right? A lot more detail there. That sort of aligns with this agile idea of progressive elaboration, right? We put a lot more work and analysis and detail into those areas of the map that we think we're going to deal with first. So obviously a decision was made here that players are probably one of the first actor groups that we want to focus on. So at the center of it all, like I already mentioned, is the why. Why are we doing this? Why do we <coughs> invest money and time? That is our goal. It works really well for milestone goals. So don't do something that's like the five-year master plan goal, but you know, like a three-month, whatever your release cadence is, maybe a three to six-month goal, um, because you want to make it short enough that you can react and that it's actually feasible and realistic, um, but big enough that there's some strategic value to it. So where does this goal come from? Well, ideally, it comes from our mission or our project charter, because those are the things that are supposed to tell us what our project is all about, right? If we don't have that, usually people come with some sort of deliverable that they would like, because that's how most projects start. Somebody comes along and says, I would like you to build this. So what we can then do is basically turn around and ask them, well, why do you need that? How, you know, what value does that have for you? How would that be beneficial to you? So basically, we can use the five whys and keep asking until we get to the point of like, what is the actual underlying goal? These goals are, of course, supposed to be smart. Specific, measurable, action-oriented, realistic, and timely. And specifically, we care about the measurable, right? We want to make sure that we can understand, that we can measure this goal because in order to drive scope from this goal, we need to understand how much of this goodness do we actually need. Right? And what's interesting too is when you have conversations around how you're going to measure progress towards this goal, that also often gives you a, good, uh, a lot of good indicators of how realistic is this in the first place. So by talking about the M, you're also addressing the R to some degree. In order to measure, we need metrics. Um, it's important that we pick the right metrics, um, kind of going with Eric Ries' advice, uh, don't pick vanity metrics, the things that make you feel good but don't actually really tell you anything about what's truly happening. Um, also, don't just go with what's easy to measure. Oftentimes, the things that you really need require some work to set up um, that you can actually track it. For this metric, we want to have a target value because part of the goal here is not just to understand what we're after, but how far do we need to go? Because that is what really outlines our scope, right? This is where we want to get with this. And overall, this, this idea of focusing on a single metric, yeah, it provides us focus for our work. So rather than going off and trying to improve 14 things at the same time, we're focusing on a single thing. And in the startup world, they actually have a name for that, the OMTM, the one metric that matters. And that is a pretty cool concept. The one metric that matters is the one thing that is most important to us based on where we are right now. <coughs> the expectation, though, is that that changes over time. I mean, the classic example from the startup world, of course, is initially I just want to, just want to attract attention. I just want to get people to sign up. Once I have a certain number of people signed up, then my next goal becomes how do I start converting these people into, you know, first maybe repeat, repeat visitors and then eventually into uh, paying customers. So the one metric that matters changes over time, but at any given point in time, there's one thing that we really, really care about. And by doing that, we hopefully get the benefits of work in progress limits, the thing we're always looking for, because that helps us deliver that value faster and not be distracted by other things. <coughs> Any questions on goals? All right. So, these goals are more at a milestone level, and obviously they are not all really super strategic. So how do we keep track of the bigger picture? Well, one approach is that we can use two levels of maps. The higher level map starts with the overall vision, the really big goal, and then we can break that down. And there's different ways we can break that down. We can break it down by sequential, you know, sort of a, a life cycle of this product, like we just like I just talked about. Or we can start break it down by maybe customer segments. Here's different you know, groups that can all contribute to this goal, but we're going to address one after the other. Um, I was just at a client uh, this week for, for a session, and one of the things that was really interesting was that they realized they had, they had, they had a number of different goals, and one of the, they had real trouble agreeing on a single goal. And one of the things that was interesting was that 
it became apparent that they were all sort of part of the same gold decomposition pyramid. There was this big thing at the top, but then they had, you know, they had a goal here, and they had a goal over here, and they were at different levels. And so we had to actually spend a good amount of time talking about what are the implications of picking a particular level of goal. You don't want to make it too big because it, it's going to take you three years to get there, and that's too long. But the problem, of course, if you go down a couple of levels, what happens? You're eliminating the rest of the pyramid, right? So now you're focusing only on the stuff that is below that particular goal. So by selecting, by going into a, a you know a decomposition of this big goal that you have, you are you are already pre uh, I mean, you are already deciding that you're only going to look at one subset of all the possible solutions. So finding the right level of goal is a very important first start. It's a very very. Um, it, it was actually kind of a painful session because they were not used to, you know, really going over this and saying, well, what is it that we're after? Um, but it was sort of the necessary pain of, it, it really revealed to them that they didn't have clarity on what it was that they were, what they really wanted and how big that solution was that they were willing to consider. So, very valuable exercise. Now, of course, um, we, we're getting a little bit into, into road mapping here, so I don't want to go a lot further. Just a sec. Um, but if you build a roadmap from these sorts of goals, what happens? Your roadmap is all of a sudden a series of business goals that you're trying to hit and no longer a bunch of predefined feature blocks, which is how we usually roadmap. Right? Normally we say, well, in quarter one we're going to do these features and in quarter two we do these. Instead, now we're saying, well, in quarter one we're going to focus on engaging these customers more to increase revenue over here and in quarter two we're then going to turn around and big, you know, get these people to buy more X. So it is a series of goals all of a sudden. But wait a second, that there's stuff we know we have to build, right? I know I need this, customer expects it, you know, there's this, this thing. Well, why do we need it? Why do we have to build this? What's the business value of that thing that we absolutely have to build? Well, if it is part of what is most important to us right now, it'll show up on our map. And if it has business value at all, it'll show eventually up on one of our milestone maps. But at that point, it will be truly prioritized by value because it'll support whatever the goal is that is most important to us at that point in time. You had a question? Yeah, I'm, I'm just curious as to how you scope this in a contract. Are you doing this consulting piece before you even start building or are you Contracting and building no, honestly, this is something that we usually do when we're there and when we have a little bit of trust build up and when there you start with something relatively small, they come in and say, I want this application to build and you're like, okay, well, let's talk about why you need that and what else could we be doing about that. Um, USCIS actually does these impact maps internally and then the results of those flow down to the teams that work on these applications, including some of ours. So yeah, it, it does happen, but it's not, you know, that's because they sort of set it up that way from the beginning. So the customer is still coming to you expecting, exp I, I, most of your customers, I would say, are expecting you to deliver a product. So they're not expecting you to It depends. I mean, we also have contracts where they just expect sort of best practices. And that makes it a little bit easier and harder at the same time because the scope isn't really defined. So you can come in and when they're, if they're open to that, you can talk about, okay, let's talk about your goals rather than just what features did you have in mind. Um, and we've had some success with that. But, I mean, it is a pretty significant shift in what, you know, how people think about stuff. So um, often it, it requires a little bit of potting. And often people do things sort of in between. I had one client where we decided that we as the development team actually in essence built the map without the customer there based on the understanding that we had from the requirements and the conversations that we had had. And then we used the map more as a communications tool. It's like, here's how we understand what you guys want. And to communicate the fact, and this is something that I'm gonna touch on again later, but to communicate the fact that along with thing that they wanted to have built, we also needed to make process changes because all of those things rolled up towards the common goal. And then we, you know, helped, it helped us align a line of uh, an understanding of what we were after, what needed to be done for that, and then where could we start. So you can kind of jump into that at different points in time. Okay.
Good question. Yeah, there isn't. So let's move on and we'll talk about it a little bit. Um, so one thing that I find helpful in this context is, you know, sometimes people, there is something that we do have to build because some important customer or some high level executive wants it that way. And those can be legitimate reasons. And so there's a concept called feature buckets that a guy called Adam Nash introduced um, that I find helpful to illustrate the point that we build things for different reasons. And of course that sentence is ludicrous. Of course we build things for different reasons. But specifically, um, Adam Nash suggested three different buckets. Um, the first bucket is customer requests. That's pretty self-explanatory. Some customer asked for that, either a current customer or a, or a potential future customer who says, if you add this feature to your product, I'm gonna buy it and that's great. The second one is the customer <coughs> delights. That's the classic Apple example. Uh, you, you found some stuff that your customers don't know yet that they want it, but once you give it to them, they're super excited because it's super awesome and that creates a lot of brand loyalty and excitement and all that good stuff. And then there's the third one, and that is the one that we care about for impact mapping in particular, the so-called metrics movers. And those are things that your customers may not care about at all, but they are important for us. They're important for our organization. This is stuff like make our process more efficient, increase our revenue. Do your customers care if you have more revenue? Nah, nah not really. Do they customers care how efficient you are in producing this product? Nope. Only insofar as it's reflected in the price, right? But it's very important to us because in the end that drives whether we survive or not. So just understanding that things fall into these different, and some things fall into mul multiple buckets and that's fine. Um, but like Amazon is a really good example for that. The first few years of their existence, they focused almost exclusively on the customer requests and the customer delights, right? They made no money whatsoever. They built stuff that people loved. They refined that over and over and over and it was great. And at some point, they had a market share position that was really dominant. And then last year, all of a sudden, they pretty drastically raised the threshold that you need to for your order before you get free shipping. Was that a customer request? Probably not. I don't think anybody asked for that. That was a metrics mover. And specifically, the metric of maybe we should start making some money from all the stuff that we're selling here, right? So that's a really good example of how they focused on the two left buckets until they didn't. All right, at the next level of our map, we ask ourselves the question, who are the people who can help us achieve this goal? Those are the actors. And um, there are actors who can support us in reaching this goal. Those are good to know. But there are also other actors, there are people who can actually obstruct or impede us from reaching this goal. And those are also important to pay attention to. Um, Goiko suggests three different type of actors. The primary actors are the direct customers or users of this thing, this workflow or value stream that we're, that we're concerned with, right? Those tend to be the people who help us advance our goal. And the next, uh, the, the, the next group is the secondary actors. Those are people who don't necessarily directly participate in this workflow, but they provide services. That might be the security folks, for example. And then the third group is the offstage actors, and those are people who are neither particularly, they don't participate in this thing and they're not particularly interested either, but they are powerful enough to basically shut us down if we don't comply. Those are people like very powerful executives, maybe not even off our chain of command, but the other chain of command who are vying politically at some top level and they want to kill this off because it makes their division look better. Or auditors, right? Federal regulators. If I'm building a product that has a goal that collides with federal regulations, I really, really want to understand whether it does or not. Unless I'm Uber, in which case I completely ignore it and just hope that I can create facts on the ground. And that can work too. But I'm sure they were relatively aware of that as a risk. Or maybe they weren't and they just got really lucky, who knows. But yeah, so one thing that I've learned, and Goiko is not very clear on that, but one thing that I think I have learned is that the primary actors are usually the people that help you advance your goal. Those are the participants in that workflow or value stream. Secondary and offstage actors, I would try to identify them, but then I would treat those mostly as potential blockers. And um, one thing, I had an interesting conversation with one of our coaches here the other night where we kind of talked about, for those people who could potentially block you, one good thing to look at is what is their lead time? What is the lead time for their feedback loop? 
If they can react to what you need within a week, eh, agile, inspect and adapt, we're good. If they have a lead time of three months for a security review, agile no longer works because that feedback loop just got too long. So in that case, I would encourage you to do very traditional proactive risk management and try to anticipate what those guys need as early as you possibly can. And I didn't just say agile no longer works, but you know what I mean. We rely in Agile sometimes a little bit too much on this idea, well, we can correct everything in two-week cycles. We don't really need to do a whole lot of forward-looking risk management. Well, it depends. It depends on whether these people are part of our two-week cadence or can adjust to that. And if they can't, then yes, we need to do traditional risk management and try to anticipate what is it that those people need, how likely is the probability of that becoming a problem, what can we do to mitigate it, all those types of things. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, Agile generally, you know, like when you start Agile somewhere, it operates in this little Agile box. And within that, you can do awesome things. But as soon as you hit the borders of that box, you realize that the rest of the world isn't quite there yet. And that's when the trouble starts. And that's why we have Scrum Masters that remove impediments, because there's always the outside of that box. But yeah, sometimes that box has very powerful walls. And when it comes to security and stuff like that, those walls are very slow, thick and very slow moving, if at all. So you want these users to be fairly specific when you put them on the map. Just saying users is a little bit vague. So maybe you want to talk about users under 23 accessing our site on mobile devices. Because that gives us much better impression of their motivation, their behaviors, you know, all those types of things. And if, as part of your user research, you have done things like personas, and this is a really good time to bring those out because personas, by definition, are different, you know, describe different user groups with different contexts and wants and needs and motivations and all those types of things. All right. At the next level, for each of these actors, we ask ourselves, how would these people, how can these people help us reach our goal? And more specifically, how would their behavior have to change in order to get us closer to our goal? What do, would they have to do differently? Well, what does that mean? It means we might be looking for things that they start doing that they haven't done before. We've got to be a little bit careful. They might already be doing things, these things, just not within our system. Or we could want them to stop doing certain things. And most of the time, of course, it's really that we just want them to do something differently from before. But we want it to be a change. We want them to do it faster, or with higher quality, or cheaper, or you know, whatever it is. And the key is that these behavior changes should be measurable. Again, we're looking for some way in which we can quantify that behavior change. We have to observe it and be able to quantify it. And finally, at the last level, we get to the what? This is where we get to do stuff. We're good at that. So we got this totally covered, right? No need to really further talk about that. But it's important to remember that we have options. Of course, we can build stuff. That is why we're software development teams. We build stuff, and we're good at that. But we could also buy stuff. You know, somebody else has already built it for us. Maybe it's cheaper to buy it. <coughs> um, maybe. It doesn't have anything to do with software at all. Maybe we just need to reorganize. Maybe there's a process change that will dramatically get us closer to this goal and we didn't write a single line of code. Or maybe we wrote some code, but it really supports this different process. There's the old saying, automating a crappy process is still a crappy process. So yeah, this is actually one of the things I really like about impact maps. It gets people to think about, there is ways of solving problems that do not involve building software. And usually when we have a software project, we don't think about that. It's like the nail and the hammer thing. Or, you know, maybe we need to train people better. Maybe we have a problem because people don't really understand the process of what they're supposed to do. Maybe we have a lot of turnover in that division and we constantly have new people and the system that we have would work if people knew how to use it. Maybe the utility isn't that great on it, but with some training we can improve things. 
Or finally, if this thing that we're trying to improve is not actually part of our core competency, if it's not part of our um, competitive advantage, maybe we can outsource it. Maybe we just get a service provider who's really, really good at that and give it to them. And that might be cheaper and faster and better and all that. So it just depends on how important is this actually to us. So, is this why it was supposed to be gone? Um, so how do we actually build a map? This is where we apply the principles of design thinking. I'm throwing out a lot of buzzwords tonight. The idea of design thinking is that we have an initial phase where we're opening things up. We're, we're growing the map. We're throwing lots of ideas out. This is the brainstorming part. We're basically diverging and coming up with all these possible solutions. This is where we can get all creative. We can you know, do process changes and, and, and features and all that good stuff. And then, of course, we have the big model in the middle that we're leaving out of this picture because it just detracts from the nice model. But once we've modeled through, we then converge by prioritizing certain actors and behavior changes that we want to look into first. This is most promising. I think we should invest in this area because we think that's going to get us to our goal the fastest with the least amount of investment. And in practice, um, it looks like this. This is actually an optional step, but you can see the map. Most of the people, most of the time when people come to you with a project idea, they've already done some thinking about it. You know, they bring you a requirements document or they have ideas about deliverables that they would want. And often a lot of really good thinking has gone into that. So we don't have to throw that away. We can basically say, well, these features that you're asking for, let's put them on the map and see whether we can figure out which of the actors in our value stream or workflow this would support and how would that feature change their behavior? And if we can fit it on the map, then let's put it on the map. It's probably a good idea, right? We don't want to take a 500 page requirements document and put all of it on that map. Most of it will actually not fit, but this is an interesting test. If we can't make that connection, it's not part of what we need right now. Maybe we'll need it later for a different milestone goal. But right now we don't. So pull out the ones that, you know, when you talk to people, this is the ones they're most passionate about. This is the ones that they, most want to have because their intuition says this is good, this is what I want. And then we open it up and do the brainstorming. This is the group activity where we want all these ideas. And so we add more actors and for each of these actors we think about what are other behavior changes that they could show and that get us closer to that goal. And then once we got that, we feel like, okay, this is probably as good as we need it for right now, or we're running out of ideas at the moment, and maybe we'll get back to this later and have new ideas based on what we learn. But for now, we're good. And then we can talk about, okay, let's prioritize. Let's, let's say this actor over here, this group of people, this customer segment, this you know, role in the workflow, whatever it is, we think they can make the biggest impact because we know that's where the problems are right now, the biggest <coughs> problems. Maybe we did some sort of value stream analysis um, and figure out this is the big bottleneck. So if we improve things here, overall it's going to get a lot better. And then we figure one of, these, one of these behavior changes is easiest to do or least risky or most promising, and then we start thinking about, okay, for that, what are the things we can do, and then we'll pick one of those. And of course the other, um, well, how, how do we prioritize? I mean, there's things like risk, of course. What's, and this is, a, this is um, you know, who are the people who can, who can stop us if we don't address their needs? So those are things we might want to address first. Um, where could we be wrong about this causal chain that we're building? Where's the highest amount of uncertainty that is really, really going to undermine the entire value proposition for this product if we don't understand that? We could talk about who are the most important actors? Well, our main customer base is this, but really we're seeing you know, those guys are tapering off and we really need to switch over to customers that use mobile devices to access our website because that's where the future is. So let's focus on that. That's where we think the growth potential is. Or maybe there's just some low-hanging fruit. You know, that thing where everybody has always said, oh, if only we could, and it costs next to nothing to do, so yeah, let's just do it and see how far that gets us. So the, all the usual prioritization things apply. Um, one of the things that Goiko suggests that is interesting is you can also use a grid, and on the x-axis of that is, here's the impact that we expect. And of course we're guessing a little bit, but we think, you know, this is gonna be a big one, this is gonna be maybe less, this one's actually negative. And then the other axis is how quickly can we observe the effect? If we build something and there's a certain behavior change that we expect, how quickly can we actually observe that? 
Because again, if the feedback loop is too long, we might be wasting resources in, you know, we're putting eggs in a basket where we don't know whether it's the right one or not. And then of course, you know, as usual, we're looking for the upper right corner. And you can take the impact, if you, if you have a hard time guessing at what the impact is gonna be, you can take that and break it down like we do so often and say, how likely is it, to, how sure are we about that? What's the probability of this actually happening? And how big would the impact, you know, how, how much of an influence would that actually have? So you can try to break it down a little bit. Because you can have a huge impact, but if, there's, if we really are wildly guessing at whether that is even gonna happen or not, then maybe that's not, the, you know, maybe that is the first thing we wanna try, but then we wanna be cheap and fast about it. Yeah, there's. I mean, th that's a very good point. You can rate. You can. You can. Um, you can do the same grid against against effort. Um, you can do it against effort first, and then the things that have roughly the same sort of ROI. You can then put those in this grid and say, well, out of the same ROI, which ones can we actually? Which ones going to show us results uh, the the fastest? What the sequence is for you depends a little bit on your situation. There's some. You know, if if, if time to market. Is, is crucial because the house is burning, then maybe the effort is, is less important, but it just depends. You're absolutely right. I only put this one up because the observability is something that we don't necessarily always think about when we make these kinds of evaluations. And I thought it was interesting that Kreutzer specifically calls that one out. Going back to your last slide, where you're translating a requirements document into uh, a, a map to be seeded and yeah. have a discussion with the customer, I'm sure you must run into some pushback from customer or contract side, no? Well, again, I mean, if the contract specifically says you will build all of these things, then you've kind of lost from the beginning. I mean, you know, then you have a fixed scope, and then the worst thing that can happen is if you not only have a fixed scope, but also fixed time and resources, um, because then you have the iron triangle nailed down and you're pretty much bound to fail. So it really depends on, is our customer even open to the idea that the scope is at least somewhat flexible? If they're not, then yeah, we're done but good luck with that. <laughs> so you've spoken of this as a uh, perfectly incremental process, but uh, how would, would you suggest we weave in the idea of uh, minimal marketing products here? Um, that is actually a really interesting question. Um, there's, there's two aspects to that. One is that if it's internal, it doesn't really matter that much. You know, we're just trying to make this process better. We make a couple of process changes here. We build one or two things, or we add those onto something that we already have. You know what, that gets us far enough. But even in that case, it is really, really hard to get people away from this idea that they want an application. It's like, the people have this thing that I'm gonna build this portal. I'm gonna get this portal. I'm finally gonna have my portal. Everybody else has a portal, and I want one too. And then you tell them, well, actually, you know, we just really need to allow people to upload these files, and then if we reorganize the, you know, distribution of tasks a little bit, then you're good. And you're like, no, but that's not my portal. So <laughs> that is a problem, and that is more of a psychological problem. So the idea that, you know what, I mean, then you really have to tell them, you know what, if we're only building this small little part of it, you know what that means? There's a lot of money left over, and you get more other stuff. But it's really hard for people to let go. And then the other thing that I just, uh, I, um, I talked to a, a group that had a very, very strong UX component and they were like, well, but it has to you know, have this overall gestalt thing where you know, everything fits together in this, in this unified customer experience. Um, and what we talked about is that sometimes maybe you have to then start thinking about, are there any rope bridges I can build? You know, if I'm just building the pillars, rather than building out the entire mountain for these people to, you know, the entire aqueduct for people to walk on, if I just build the pillars that give me the real value, can I use some sort of UX icing to build a rope bridge, a rope bridge that gets people relatively seamlessly from here to here without filling everything in, in yeah, between? Yeah, I was thinking you need to translate this then to a story map. Yeah. The story map is like, yeah, you, you break it out. I mean, everybody somewhat familiar with story maps. The idea is that you break out what is sort of the minimum set of steps that get me from A to B in a somewhat cohesive fashion that somebody could actually, you know, walking the skeleton kind of thing. And then I go deep on two things or three things because that's where we make the biggest improvements and everything else. I just, I give people just enough that they can sort of, you know, I can guide them along because we don't want to lose them along the way. And that is a valid concern. Fixed uh, product uh, requirements, but we 
that on fixed price and fixed time, but with that also comes what government is supposed to supply you to. So you can use that as a negotiation tool to your agile sense. Okay, you will promise you will give you sisters a chance to do this, but they will not. <laughs> <laughs> True. So it depends on how it is yeah. negotiated. Yeah. I have used that successfully with yeah. the people that have been very mad at me, but yeah. then you can do it about it. Yeah. Well, and then there's obviously, you know, like a third through, they inevitably come up with something else that would be really yeah, yeah. awesome to have. And you're like, well, we can give you that, but it kind of means we have to sc change scope because right. we can't add it on. We can just replace stuff. Yeah. So it just depends on how willing they are in that case to then kind of under the hood work with you and how much they get the idea that learning is a good thing and they can get more value if they go with that. But I mean, I'm not a contract specialist, so. So say we've built this map. Now what do we do with it? To go back to our example here, let's say you know we have decided that probably the most powerful way of attracting new players to this game is if our existing players invite their friends. Because that's you know a personal relationship that we're using here and it's awesome. So in this case they just dot voted and they're like. So the best thing we could do is allow people to send semi-automated, to, to, to give them a feature with these semi-automated invites. Maybe they can you know, import all their Facebook friends and it automatically sends an invite to everybody and you know, hopefully they'll sign up. So now what? Well, one thing that's pretty cool about these maps is that we can actually directly read user stories from the map, right? As a player, I want automated invites so that I can invite my friends and this is directly mapping back to our who, how, and what. But let's take one step back here. As a player, do I really want automated invites? Yeah, no, not really, right? I don't care about that. If anything, it should be as the product manager, I want automated invites, blah, blah, blah. So it does, it's already not the direct reading off the, off the map here anymore. It's a little disingenuous if we phrase it like that. But there's actually a bigger problem. And that is, when we pick a particular what from that map, when we prioritize that, we pick that because we think it will have the biggest impact towards our goal, right? That is why we prioritize it. Now there is one small problem with that. We are poor at assessing the value of ideas. This is a quote from a paper by these two gentlemen here at the bottom. Ron Kahavi used to work at Amazon. He is now, or I don't know if he still is, but at some point he was Director of Experimentation at Microsoft, which is one cool title. I'd like to be a Director of Experimentation at some point. And what he did is they wrote a paper where they pulled together a number of admittedly smaller studies, um, but still, where they basically showed that even at very high performing organizations like Google, Microsoft, Amazon, Netflix, Intuit, Etsy, you know, the real heavy hitters in the industry, when they ran experiments, try out business ideas, and I would argue that they are high performing organizations exactly because they run a lot of experiments, in addition to other things, but it definitely contributes. When they run these experiments, they found that the first version of what they were trying to do only yielded the desired business value impact between 10 and 35% of the time. Okay. <laughs> That's one way of looking at it. If I flip that around, that basically means that between two thirds and 90% of the time, they were wrong. And those are highly qualified people who understand their domain who thought this was a good enough idea to even try it out. This is not the discard stuff. This is the like, hey, let's run an experiment and spend some money on that. And full one third of the time, they actually moved the needle in the wrong direction. That is that whole thing about complexity that we talked about at the beginning, right? It's very, it's getting harder and harder to understand. If we tweak this one thing over here, what's gonna come out on the other side of this super complex system that we're building? Healthcare.gov, anyone? You know, those types of things. Um, those studies show that it's between 10 and 35% are successful. Like about a third actually, again, this is according to this paper, but uh, about, uh, a quarter, about a third actually yield results that were either um, just something totally different or actually counter to what they were looking for. Um, the, the, the paper is in the slide at the very end and we'll make the slides available so you can actually read it yourself. It's pretty dry, but there's some good stuff in there. One of the, uh, one of the quotes from the paper that I, that I thought was interesting was, I don't remember which company the guy was from, but he was like, well, you know, it's, it's, pretty, it's pretty humbling that after all these years in this industry, my success rate still isn't any better. To me, 
this is a very fundamental idea because it takes the idea that it takes this notion of a requirement that's going to solve our problem and puts a whole lot of big question marks after that, right? How do we know that this is the right thing that's going to solve our problem? Well, most of the time we kind of don't. So what that means is that when we decide this is what we're going to do and we pick something out of these many, many possible options that we have, we're basically making an assumption. And the good thing is, well, the bad thing is that normally these assumptions are hidden. When we write a requirement, even when we write a user story, that assumption is baked right in, but we never talk about it. And even if I understand that it's an assumption, once I bring that, you know, as the product owner, once I bring that to other stakeholders, they don't know it's an assumption. Everybody goes like, yeah, that's what we should do. Totally. Somebody figured that out. Now, the nice thing about impact maps is that it, makes, it helps us make these assumptions visible. And there's not only one, but actually two levels of assumptions in this impact map. And the first one is, of course, that if we build this what for these people who, their behavior is going to change how. If I build this button that allows people to invite all their friends, they're actually going to click it. Well, yeah, maybe they will. Or maybe they won't. Or maybe some of them will, but not enough to really make a difference. Right? That is an assumption. We build something, people will use it in the way that we expect them to. And then the second level of assumption is that if people actually do what we think they're going to do, that is really going to contribute to our goal. So here, basically, if this who changes their behavior in the way we expect, that will make a difference. So people click the button and invite all of their friends are these people, are those friends then going to come and sign up? Or is their Facebook feed irrelevant because nobody looks at Facebook anymore anyway? At least not if they're under 25. Or maybe there's just so much stuff going on that getting an additional invite is like, yeah, whatever. I have cat videos, incubated videos to watch. So we can look at this map and directly read these assumptions off of here. But now we have an understanding of the uncertainty. That's great, but um, OK, so now what? <laughs> we know we're not really sure about it. Is there some sort of way we can test these things out before we commit to building it all? Well, I'm glad you asked, because there is something that comes from the Lean UX world, and it's called a testable hypothesis. And it goes like this. We believe that doing this for these people will achieve this outcome or impact. And very importantly, we'll know this is true when we see this market feedback or some other quantitative indicator. Sometimes it's not about a market, but it's about some measurable thing. <coughs> if you look at just the upper part of that, does that look sort of familiar? What, what does it look like? It's a user story? It's a user story, but it's a, it's a user story rephrased. And what is the difference? A user story is a declarative statement. I know it to be true that as the user you want this. <laughs> right? This says, well, we believe this is what you want. And if we gave it to you, then you're going to do this thing with it. But two differences. A, we're acknowledging the uncertainty. And the second one is we have now defined how do we know that this is actually true? What do we need to look at to figure out whether this is correct or not? We have defined success criteria. Big difference. Now, am I saying that you should turn everything into a testable hypothesis? No. There's stuff you're just going to build. But you might want to look out for those things that are really, really fundamental to your value assumptions, to the value proposition that your product is supposed to have. The types of things where if you're wrong about that assumption, your product is no longer going to have the impact overall. It's not going to be interesting to your customer. It's not going to be competitive. It's not going to create the type of interest or market share that you're looking for or the type of improvement, right? Those are the things that you want to pull out, understand what the assumptions are that are baked into this, and figure out how to test that early. And the good thing is, again, this ties directly back to our map, of course. We believe that doing this, what, for these people, our actors, will achieve this behavior change. And then we have some sort of measurable goal there. 
And talking about measuring, when we, of course, the thing we really care about is the why, the big goal in the middle, right? The problem is that very often, that we want to measure that, but very often this big thing in the middle is what we call a lagging indicator. It takes a while to become visible. Market share, at the end of the quarter at best, and you add another two months until you know, the industry studies are out. Increased revenue, yep, accounting will have that for you in five months and 12 days. So it takes a while, right? The good part is that there is something else we can measure, and that is the behavior change. And those things are leading indicators in the sense that we can, al we can see them almost immediately. If we build a web-based system and we put a new button in there, we have real-time feedback on whether people are clicking that button and how, what percentage out of the sessions that we're serving are, you know, is that button being clicked. Now, does this get us all the way along our assumption chain? No. But it gets us halfway there, which is a lot better than what we're doing right now, which is usually just putting it out there, declaring that we're done, and moving on. Right? Even companies or organizations that do a lot of user research, that invest that time in trying to figure out what is it that our users want, what are they going to react to, what are they going to like, once they've decided, they build it and they move on. Very few of them actually go back and figure out, did that really do what we thought it was going to do? It's true, right? We don't close that loop. We're already happy if we're doing the research up front and don't just have the hippo decide this is what's good because I'm the boss and let's <laughs> do it. Everybody know what the hippo is? Anybody who doesn't know what the hippo is? The highest paid person's opinion? Uh, I love that term. It's awesome. All right. Um, so what do we do with that? Well, we built this thing, and now we can draw on a lesson from the Lean Startup. Basically, should we persevere, continue along that same route based on the feedback that we're getting, or do we need to pivot and try something else? So say we built this button, and none of our current players click it. Well, does that mean we should give up on it? Not necessarily. Maybe it's just that inviting your Facebook friends is just not what anybody cares about anymore. Maybe five years ago that would have been awesome. Maybe today what I need to do in order to get my players interested is create some viral content so they can send bunny versus cat cage fight to their friends. I don't know. I need to brush up on my memes. I'm sure that's like... <laughs> anyway, but so, you know, we don't know. Well, what if all of our players click that button and we get no sign-ups from it or like, you know, three people sign up. Ooh. Then what? Does that mean that the idea of, of, you know, that maybe the idea of people inviting their friends just isn't that powerful, as powerful as we thought? Well, maybe. And then, you know, we could focus on advertising or something like that. But maybe it just means that, yeah, it's great that friends get their friends to sign up, but maybe the way to convince those friends to sign up is not with some lame invite. Maybe we need to create viral content of bunny versus cat. I don't know. The thing is, it's not always clear cut. This is not a science. It's still, you know, we still have a need for, for product researchers and product managers and the people who have that sort of intuitive feeling of what works and what doesn't. But what it highlights is the fact that we need to be able to test these things very quickly and very cheaply because we might potentially want to iterate through a whole bunch of them. But now we're doing it systematically and we're doing it in the priority of what we think is going to be successful. And the nice thing is this map is lightweight enough that as we learn more about it, we can revisit this map and say, you know what, this branch, snip, not working, let's cut it off. We'll leave it here so that we know what we had, but then we'll get rid of all the details. And instead, we're going to elaborate on something else now. Or we have milked this particular branch for all it's worth, and it's gotten us 60% you know, of the way there, and that's awesome, because this was cheap. But we still have 40% to go towards our goal. So we have to find more. Okay? So the idea is that this gets updated over time to incorporate this validated learning that we're trying to get here. Lean startup buzzword. Uh, it incorporates, this brings together a lot of really interesting concepts that have sort of emerged over the last few years. All right. Let's build an impact map. I have a scenario here. How are we doing on time? We have a little bit. All right. So your relevant CXO comes with a request to rebuild your homegrown, homegrown online recruiting site to make it easier for people to submit their applications and for the recruiters to track them. 
you look at the requirements document and start asking questions about how these features would be useful and why we need them. And eventually, you'll get to the core issue. Your medium-sized company is growing fast, and you desperately need to hire more people, and soon. Web analytics show that many applicants drop out somewhere during the application process, and so the CXO wants to address that. And after talking to recruiting, they also had some complaints of how hard it is to do their job with the system, and so some of their ideas were added as well. Now, you've heard about some other possible issues with recruiting, sort of through the grapevine, that maybe HR isn't talking about. And you're not convinced that rebuilding the whole recruiting site is the best approach. So after some more conversations, you get the CXO to agree to try this impact mapping thing you've been talking about. So you come up with a goal to hire 100% more people in the next six months. And you use the requirements document to seed the map, and then you call a meeting with the senior technical and business people. And I'm going to get you guys started on the first activity before I set up the webcam so we can talk about how the map is being seeded here. So we have a goal of hiring 100% more people in the next six months, right? What else would we need to know? That is a good question, yes. But even before that, Why? Well, because we're growing and we need to staff our contracts and all that. But remember how we talked about this whole investment thing? How much money are you going to give me for this? Because if you give me three million bucks, I can get you those people. I'll just go out and pay everybody a $50,000 sign-up bonus and I'll have them in one evening. How long they stay? I don't know. But I fulfilled my goal and it was pretty easy. But it was also very expensive. So, okay, you get $150,000 to spend on this. Is that enough? Maybe. Not money, but is that enough information? No. no. All right, so we want to know a few other things, right? The first thing we want to know is, OK, what is it that we're actually tracking? So we're tracking the number of hires. That one's pretty easy. Where are we, where are we going to get this metric or this measurement? Well, that was pretty easy, too, in our recruiting system, whether it's the old one or some new one that we're building. But we know how many people we're hiring. That one's not hard. However, in order to uh, hire 100% more people, what else do we need to know? We need to know where we're at right now. So we want to know the benchmark. Where are we at now so that we know how much improvement we actually need? From that, we can then calculate our target value, which so far has only been expressed as percentage, but 100% more. Normally, we hire 20 people in six months. For a medium-sized company, that's somewhat realistic, maybe. So now we want to hire 40 people in the next six months to accommodate this gigantic project that we just got. And then the last one is sort of optional. You can define, if you want to, uh, what's called a break-even or sort of minimum value. And this is a value where basically like, well, we're shooting for 40, but if we get 30 in the next six months, then we're pretty OK with that and we're content. Now, one sort of lesson learned for this one, I have come around to, depending on the culture of the organization that this is where this is happening, I am willing to step back and let the product owner or the sponsor or whatever not publicly define the target value. Because sometimes some improvement is better than no improvement, especially once you've committed your money. And sometimes it's important that people can declare success after the fact. Maybe because the goal was unrealistic to begin with, or maybe because you just had absolutely no idea what's possible. So in an organization where failure is a career killer, where people are not willing to admit that there's uncertainty, where everybody has walk, you know, walks around chest puffed out and declares that, you know, I know everything because that's my manager around here. In organizations like that, it might be safer to just not really say how much you're after. You still want to know your baseline, and you still maybe want to have an internal target, but maybe you don't need to make a big poster about it. <coughs> so that depends on the, the politics of, of, of the place. All right. So. I am going to see if I have my, I need to escape out of this, and then I need to switch to this. And then I need to, sorry, this is always the tricky part. Okay. Reasonably okay, I'll fiddle with it a little bit while you guys are busy. But, so this is, I've seeded the map. And at the goal here, in the middle here, is our goal. Hire 20 more people in the next six months. And I've put the two actors that have already been identified. 
HR or recruiting, I've just kind of thrown them in the same you know, bucket, and the applicants. And the applicants could pretty please complete more applications, right? And the way we think we're gonna help them do that is by improving the usability of the site. And for HR, well, they tend to keep track of our best applicants and not really follow up on time. So the things that we wanna do for them is that, A, we wanna give them a report that sorts these people by the initial assessment that they did. So we know that the ones that got the best initial assessments are at the top and are probably getting attention earlier. And then we also wanna allow them to set different reminder intervals so that if it's someone that we're really interested in and you haven't touched base with them in two days, you get a reminder. And for the people that we may be a little bit less keen on, we can get a reminder after a week, right? Those are the ideas that HR had. Is that the only things we can do? Probably not. So. There's different ways of how you can do this in an actual session. If it's a, an organization where you have a lot of hierarchy and it's not a particularly safe space, then you probably want to have people sit down and write silent stickies or silently write stickies like we do at Retros and stuff like that, right? We are all great friends. We know each other. We're perfectly safe here. So what we can do is we can just call out stuff. It's brainstorming. So who would have, who has some ideas for other possible actors that could help us contribute to this goal? by doing something, by changing their behavior? Hiring managers. Hiring managers. Okay, what else? Current employees. Current employees, all right. Accounting slash finance support team. Okay. Huh, okay. How would they have to change their behavior? Okay, um, but does that directly drive up the numbers? And don't worry, I mean, I'm, I'm, these are the kinds of questions, these are exactly the kinds of questions we wanna have come out as these kinds of conversations. Um, I would argue that those people are more on the implementer side. Those are people who do some of the what's, who are responsible to helping with the what's. So primarily we're looking for people who are directly part of this process. All right, you know what, we have four actors, it's good enough. We don't actually care about figuring out how to do better hiring. We just kind of want to walk through the process, right? <laughs> Sometimes when you do this stuff in like small groups, people will have like 15 minute fierce conversations about whether HR is better suited for this than you. You're like, people, we, we, we're not solving this problem actually. <laughs> Man, it's like sometimes it's really. Um, all right, any other suggestions that we want to put on there? Are you good enough, are you good with four? Four is good. Four is good? All right, so the next thing I'm gonna ask you to do, no, sorry, I'm an agile coach. The next thing I'm going to invite you to do <laughs> is take these, take these sheets on your chair and um, start filling it in. On the left side, you put in actors. You can take any of these four or you can add new ones if you want to. So feel free, be creative. And then think about how would these actors have to change their behavior to help us hire more people, all right? And really try to think about it that way. This person would have to do that thing, and that would result in more hires. All right, let's do three minutes, and then we'll collect some. And one version you could do this in a group is if we had round tables, if we had like you know a typical like six to twelve person group, and we're all around the same table, you can actually have people pass these sheets on after a minute. And so you get that effect of like, oh, I can look at what other people have already written and it inspires me and has, I have new ideas and I can build on that. So you get a little bit of that sort of wisdom of the crowd effect. We can't do that because there's too many empty seats and all that and at the end, they would just drop off the face of the earth.
Um, it's going to be yours in the end, so however, usually you would put one how per row, but you can have the same actor multiple times okay. with different behavior changes. Okay. This is pretty free form. This is just one way of kind of helping you think through it. And again, normally, I mean, like you could pass these around and then get other people's ideas <coughs> and like, oh, that person could also do this or, you know, whatever. So it's just one minute, one of many possible techniques. Um, we can put, how would the hiring managers help us, you know, hire more people? What would current employees have to do in order for us to hire more people? Either way, whatever, whatever gets your creative thinking going. All right, this is awesome. I see a lot of you really like looking at these sheets and thinking hard. This is great. You're taking this serious. I love it. Thank you. That's great. All right, so again, we're not trying to solve the actual problem. This was just to kind of give everybody a few minutes to think about, okay, how would I, how would I think about this kind of, you know, how would I structure this kind of thinking? What is it that we're after? So, um, you know, we could take these things and write them all out into stickies and everything. What we, we're going to do, again, just call some of these out and talk about them and, you know, the different things that are going to come up. So who wants to start? Who has an idea? Hey, Becca? Sure. Okay. Um, sent the employees to bring their friends and ten employees. What was that second sentence? That will or could uh -huh. be sent current employees to bring their friends and other ten employees. So which is the behavior change that we're actually after? The behavior change is on the part of the employee, but the incentive right. has to be in place by the HR manager to make things right. do it. Good. So the how that we're looking for, probably, is for current employees to refer their network, right? Yeah. Their friends, whatever. And you already touched on the next level. What is it that we, as an organization, could do to help our current employees change their behavior that way? Number one, offer an incentive, and number two, hold mini town halls to actually communicate the skills that we're looking for. Okay. So we could or whatever you know, communication vehicle that will actually get in front of the employee. Right. So for one, we could ha we could have referral bonuses, and it depends a little bit on our situation. If we never had a referral bonus, then offering a referral bonus at all, you know, could potentially have a pretty good impact. If we already have a referral bonus, do we think about raising it? Do we think about raising it only for certain types of positions? Do we? offer different referral bonuses for senior people versus junior people because the senior people have probably milked their network for all it's worth for a long time. So if we want more from those guys, we're going to have to convince them to, in the long run, go to more meetups and carefully build up a new network. The guys that we just got straight out of university, they can refer all of their roommates and we don't have to pay them a lot because, <laughs> hey, they're young, they do this for a right? So you can start breaking that further apart. Current employees, are they senior current employees? Are they junior current employees? Are the motivations different? Or is it what the value is to the company? Are you going to pay based on, not based on their seniority, but just the right. what the seniority of the person is coming in? Do I pay more for a senior DevOps engineer than for a junior BA or you know whatever it is? Yeah, absolutely. But see, what the first thing that happened is we already said, like maybe current employees is actually not the right actor. Maybe we need to break that out into senior employees and junior employees. Maybe we need to break it down into software engineers versus, um, you know, different. So this is part of the, this is a very good one. This is part of this, those are the types of conversations we want to have because what we're doing is we're, we're breaking things further apart and we're understanding that the more specific we are about the users, the actors that we have on here, the more specific we can get about doing targeted things that are good for that group and maybe not for others. Okay, great example. And even the fact that you started with the what and I'll grant you, it's a little bit fuzzy because, but it's not really a behavior change, offer more money, okay? So one way you can keep this thing, you, you, can, you can get sort of past this, like people will get the what's in the house mixed up all the time. That is totally natural. So one way that I found that kind of helps is phrase it as a testable hypothesis. We believe that 
offering our current employees a referral bonus will result in them referring their network. That sounds pretty reasonable, right? We will, we believe that having hiring managers offer a bonus, what? And now we have to go to somebody else doing something. You know what I'm saying? The noun changes. It's no longer about the same people. The behavior changes now in someone else because the behavior changes over here. So using that testable hypothesis phrase is a good way of testing. Am I talking a what or a how? And if it's a what, then what is, the, what is that supposed to do? Why would we do that? And who do we think that influences? OK? And this happens all the time. So don't, you know, totally, like this is the first thing that always happens. But using the testable hypothesis phrasing of it, if that sounds right to you, then it's probably a good hypothesis. If there's something off, or if all of a sudden the, the person you started with is no longer the person who's changing their behavior, or who's, you know, where we expect some outcome, then it's probably that you're talking about a what. And the imp you started with the implementer. All right, other thoughts? Oh, wait, sorry, I forgot to write down the, what is it, the referral bonus? And you said just offering better information than other people even know what we're looking for. Hmm? Job fairs. Okay. All right, so job fairs. What would a job fair? That's another what potentially. Well, let's go somewhere else. Who else has an idea? Go ahead. So it's a good thing that you mentioned the whole hypothesis and you said that request. I originally had it for hiring managers, mm -hmm. but it's more for HR when it says if we could provide HR a uh, faster 10 day, one day turnaround feedback on Okay, so now we're basically saying that. I had it for hiring managers that if they were to provide faster feedback. Okay, what's the behavior I change we want to see? But I think it's more for the HR if they get that. Right? Okay, but who's, whose behavior are we changing with that? The hiring managers. Yeah. Okay. I think that's exactly what I had. All right, um, spell, spell that out for me if you don't mind. So provide same day or one day turnaround. We believe, we believe that, and actually it's interesting, you can even phrase it if you just, if it's active voice, it's, it has to be us doing something for somebody. More so, applicants. right, we believe that more applicants will stay in the process if we give them one day turnaround, right? So what we're looking for is we want our applicants to complete more applications. In order to do that, we can give them faster feedback. The implementer, the person potentially doing that, <coughs> would be the hiring managers of HR. But the behavior change we're trying to see is really over here. That's just, you're asking the applicant for behavior to change. Because that's not necessarily what happens. Right? It's usually on the hiring managers where this problem happens. Well, the behavior change we want to see is that these people complete their applications and don't drop out. Well, the application is already filled out. There's more information. Well, OK. I mean, they don't drop out of the recruiting process. OK, so maybe what we need is also don't drop out of the recruiting process. Yeah. OK? And again, this is not, this is not a, I'm not trying to, this is exactly the kinds of conversations that we want to have. And by asking these sort of structured questions, are we doing something for somebody else so that they change their behavior? Those are the things we're after. Um, this is one thing that happens a lot that people, and, and honestly, Goiko is a little squid on that because one of the actors he has in, an example, in his example is advertisers. We don't care about advertisers changing their behavior by publishing our ads. What we care about is the people seeing those ads changing their behavior because we put an ad in front of them. So I actually think he's a little bit not entirely strict on that. Be careful not to put the people who implement the what's up as actors. Your development team should hardly ever show, should not show up on this map unless what you're trying to do is improve the development process. In which case, yes, the development team probably needs to change their behavior in some shape, way, or form. Okay, so these are, these are all great examples because they highlight exactly the things um, that you need to be really aware of. So we could add another sticky here, complete the recruiting, don't drop, you know, less, drop, um, less dropouts during the recruitment process. And then one of the things we could do is give them faster feedback. 
yeah, we could yeah, here improve usability. We could have you know maybe don't don't ask them for too much information until we've actually given them some indication <coughs> that you're through the first gate. No, I'm not going to give you my social security number until you've invited me to Which an interview. It's really weird because when you write the software story, it looks like a feature to the hiring manager, but it's actually trying to get the yeah. effect on the outcome. Yeah, and it might, but in this case, it might just be a process change. You know, I mean, obviously, providing a referral bonus is not a software feature, and yet it might be a lot more powerful than twiddle, you know, than fiddling with your software over here. And this is exactly the power of the impact map that it makes us consider process changes, policy changes, software features, external services we can buy, all this other stuff, right? It's not all about building software. The, the, what we're trying to do is reach the goal. How we get there does not matter. It's just that we want the cheapest and fastest way to get there so that we can move on and spend whatever money is left on the next thing that's important, all right? So those are all great, great examples. Um, Honestly, you guys managed to sort of cover all of the points that I really tried to bring up, uh, bring out during this exercise in two or three examples. So you are an extremely efficient uh, group here. <laughs> so I appreciate that. So in the interest of time, I'm going to move uh, talk through the last couple of slides that I have. But obviously, you can't simulate a full impact mapping session. A full impact mapping session takes hours. But Hopefully, this gives you some of the ideas. If these are the kinds of questions, these is how, this is how we want to dissect these things. These are the kinds of patterns that we can apply, whether you know this is at the right place in the map. Talking about, do we need to break our actors into subgroups? And you can be creative. You can take this and then just add like sub-actors to that and break it out. So you can do like the inheritance thing and all of that. <laughs> this is not strict. Whatever works for you, works for you. And that's why you want to do it on whiteboards and with stickies, because you're going to be doing a lot of moving things around. So we already read one of the hypotheses off of it. We basically said that, yep, we believe that giving current employees a referral bonus will have, you know, entice them to refer their network, and that will hopefully help us with getting more employees. So that is how you end up talking about this map, creating this map. And as you do that, people all of a sudden have a shared understanding of like, OK, this is what we're trying to do. These are the different options. And you know what? This one is actually probably cheaper and faster than building software, because we can put a referral bonus out tomorrow, and hopefully people will start bringing in their friends the day after, right? So maybe that's a lot faster than spending three months on updating the system. So let me go back to this and this. Is this a front end analysis for building a value chain? So it seems overlapping. Um, I think understanding, yeah. I think understanding the value stream or at least your workflow is not a bad th exercise to, to do before you do this because it helps you identify actors. Um, and by the way, Goico has some really interesting activities and games and other facilitation techniques, um, both in the book and on the website and in a bunch of different articles. Um, when people have problems finding actors, there's a game for that. There's something that he published that's called the trump card game, where you basically people write out as many of these actor and behavior change combinations, and then you know whoever has the most ideas for the actor so it's, it wins, and it's gamified, and all that kind of good stuff. So there's lots of other things you can do. That's sort of impact mapping 201, so not part of an intro session, but there's definitely a lot more material. You're not stuck with, with just these sort of basic techniques. All right, so we talked about this. Um, here's a couple of lessons learned. This is some of the sort of painful stuff. Um, the first one is do not try to build your first impact map with your senior stakeholders in the room. It will not end well. There's a lot of sort of little subtleties to this process and senior stakeholders tend to get very upset when there's these little things where you're like trying to fit, fit or figure out on the fly. How do I decide whether this is a what or a how? How do I get people away from jumping straight into the solutions all the time? Practice this with your team, potentially like with people that you feel comfortable with, potentially try to build the same impact map that you want to build with your senior, senior stakeholders. Build it in a small group. You will have some anticipation of the conversations that are going to come up. Is somebody going to inevitably suggest that um, hiring managers, uh, managers offering a referral bonus is the behavior change? You will already have had that conversation and you have a much better handle on how do I get people to sort of under, you know, understand the subtleties. So yeah, don't try it first, first time, don't try it with your senior stakeholders. The second one is we just talked about that. Distinguish your actors from your implementers. If it is the person implementing that thing, that what, 
they probably shouldn't be on the map. It is the person who is impacted by that change, the person whose behavior changes because we did something. Passive voice. We believe that by doing this, us doing this for these people, these people will change their behavior. Use that sort of phrase to figure out whether you're on the right level. Um, again, using the hypothesis format to differentiate what's from how's. We just discussed that. There's another one here, a really good one. Always ask, how do we measure this? If somebody says, I want, to, you know, I want this behavior, this is a behavior change that I think would be good. How do we measure this? How do we measure that people are referring their, fr uh, their friends? Well, because we see an uptick in our referral feature or you know, in our referral emails or whatever it is. How do we know that people complete more applications? Well, we can measure that, that people made it to the last screen and actually hit that submit button, right? So always ask how do we measure that because that is that first leading indicator that we're gonna be looking for. It also helps you validate whether this is, valid, this is a, good, a good chain in the first place. Um, impact maps can be used differently in different contexts. Who here works for an organization where it is easy to get money for, to run experiments, to get a little bit of a budget to run an experiment? Raise your hand if it's easy to run an experiment in your organization. Not a whole lot. Wow, all right. So you are all in that lower row. The ability to invest stuff in experiments can either be good or not so good. How about, what are the consequences if you deploy something based on an idea of what you think is the right thing to do and you are wrong about it? What happens? What are the consequences? Did you just build the latest space shuttle and now we're all very, very sad? Or are you building a website where you put the wrong button out there and some people sit and got to a 404 and moved on after briefly cursing you? <laughs> so for raise your hand if the consequences of being wrong are very, very grave and bad and important. Okay, one, two, three, okay. So the majority of you are sort of down here. It's hard for us to experiment, but if we're wrong, eh, it's not that big a deal. So for you, impact mapping, the best thing that can come out of that is probably that you can align your stakeholders. You kind of get everybody that shared understanding, where should we start, and then we build it because we can't actually experiment with anything, and then we'll see whether it's right or wrong, and if it's right, we're lucky, and if not, then we'll just have to start all over. If the consequences are pretty severe, then you can, but you can't really experiment, you can use the impact map to figure out what is the one experiment, the one thing that we really need to test before we deploy it. Right? So you're aligning people along, what is it that we should try out? <coughs> we can't try out a lot of stuff. We can't just deploy it right away because we really have to make sure it's the right thing. So let's align on what is the thing that we want to try. If that's bad, we go back and figure out the next thing to try. If it's good, then we can deploy that. In the upper right corner, um, in the upper left corner where you can run experiments and it doesn't really matter whether what you do is right or wrong, you can just figure out what you want to try next. You implement it, you see whether it's good, and you just iterate that until you get it right. If you can experiment well, but the consequences of being wrong are, are high, then what you can do is you can run multiple experiments in parallel. You can use the impact map to identify these are the top three things we think are good candidates. We're gonna try all three of them because that way we parallelize it and if all three are great, well, awesome, we do all three of them. If only one of them is successful, at least we have a path forward. Right? Again, in the references, there's an article where that's explained in more detail, but it's kind of an interesting, interesting thing to think about because it, you know, the result, the outcome of what you do with an impact map is not always the same. It depends on, on, on these sort of two factors. All right, this is it. Key points, start with the goal. Do your features last? Entirely against human nature, so yeah. <laughs> right. We all like to come up with the solutions first and then figure out what it is that we're actually trying to do. Um, think about into IT and talk about IT as an investment toward the organization's goals rather than just a cost center, okay? Gets you a totally different seat at the table, hopefully. But it's an interesting conversation to have. How much money do you wanna invest in this particular goal? Because honestly, you're gonna need software to reach this goal. Maybe along with some other things, but chances are software is a part of it. Super important. Your backlog is a set of value assumptions. Now again, not everything that's in the backlog is crucial and needs to be tested out in great detail, but there are things in there that are assumptions, and if you're wrong about them, then your product will not fulfill the value expectation that you overall had for this thing. Find those, 
and treat them as assumptions, acknowledge the uncertainty that we don't know, and find ways of testing them quickly, cheaply, and with results that give you some indication of are we on the right track or not. Do not ever try to build the entire map. There's a quote by Jeff Patton, I think, who says there's always more stuff that, uh, that you want to build than you have time, money, or resources for, or whatever the exact quote is. And that is absolutely true. We're always whittling down scope because we never have enough money and time to build everything. So do not build the entire map ever. Pick the fastest and cheapest way to get there, which is why you need to know when you're <coughs> done. Understand what your target value is, measure that, and stop when you're done, and move on and spend your money on something that provides more value. And that's it. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> Mark. <laughs> Me? Yeah, uh, Mark. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Uh, lastly, there's some note cards in the back. Uh, any feedback you want to provide? Green, you did great. Yellow, some ideas for improvement. And red, really missed the mark. Feel free to let us know. Um, we have, always have too much pizza. Feel free to take it. Nobody will judge you. I'll be very appreciative, actually. Um, <laughs> 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 see you in the future. Thanks, guys. Thank you. Thank you.